it was more than just an insurrection. You know, it was like an, an, an indicator, uh, an expression of something deep under the hood. This is American Issues Take Two. I'm Jay Fidel, and I have with me uh, my co-host, uh, uh, Tim Apicella. We're going to talk about that today. Let me let me make uh, welcome to the show, Tim. Thank you, Jay. I'll make a little bit of an introduction. You know, it was more than just an insurrection. What is happening under the hood? Uh, something is happening. And, and I say that because the it's so odd what we find is the likely result of these elections 12 days away. And we have the insurrection boys, they're still around. They have not been broadly, widely uh, prosecuted. Um, the trials are still going on almost two years after the fact. Um, and, and we have, um, you know, the, the, top, the top dogs have not been reached. Uh, we have the acolyte boys, they're still there. They're still embedded, where, where are they? But they're still there. You still hear from them. In Congress, they're in, oh my God. We have the boys in Moscow. Never forget the boys in Moscow. We have the Internet Research Agency. We have, uh, you know, Putin and his friends and his oligarchs. He can say that he's under political pressure and people don't like what he's doing in Ukraine. But the fact is, he's still running the show. He's still got the levers of power. And he's still interested in having Trump win. So my proposition is, uh, you know, let me throw it at you, Tim. We're all being distracted. Uh, every day we hear about, you know, the possible indictments and the investigations and all the, um, you know, the strategies that the Department of Justice and the FBI should use uh, and all these, um, you know, potential criminal actions and civil actions and whatnot and how Trump could get dinged on them and, uh, and the expectation that the results of those legal proceedings are somehow going to uh, affect um, the election in 12 days. So if we connect the dots, though, and we look back at uh, 2016 and what he was doing in 2020, for that matter, uh, we are, and, and what, the, what the news is today, the real news about the likely result of this election, the likely expression of power by Trump and his friends and his base, uh, we're, we're in for a bad time. We're in for a clear and dangerous autocracy. So was 2020 a replay of Putin's, you know, help in 2016? And will 2022, two weeks away, um, be a replay of 2016? So let me ask you some questions, Tim. Have the voters gotten smarter or not? I think a lot of voters have resigned themselves to um, go with the flow. I think they're burned out on politics. I think they have bread and butter issues that need uh, their attention, inflation, uh, the rising price of everything. And politics has taken a back seat. And the drama that follows politics has taken a back seat. I'm not going to say they've become apathetic, but I'm saying they are distracted. And some are good reasons to be distracted, and, and many aren't. Uh, certainly, you, you alluded to the, um, uh, the, you know, the, the little news blurbs here and there that distract us from the main issue. What is the main issue? I think it's one party's desire to retain power and undermine electoral, uh, the electoral system that can switch power to another party if one party is not satisfying the needs of the people of the country. And I think there's <clears throat> the movement underfoot to seriously um, damage and hamper our two-party electoral system. And you mean overthrow the government? Overthrow I, the well, constitutional okay. I, government? I was going to go there for a minute. I mean, Donald Trump is a self-described nationalist. Every time I think of a nationalist, I think of a soft-footed fascist. And I do believe that Donald Trump wants to move in the direction of, of turning our, our republic into a form of fascist uh, dictatorship with him being at the top of it. And I don't think that's hyperbole. I've seen enough examples of it now in the last five years. Connect the dots. You'll see exactly very similar things that every uh, democratic society, as they turn into a more of an autocracy, you'll see the exact same things take place. You mentioned uh, Ann Applebaum and, and her ability to define that slow move from a democracy, from a republic, into an autocracy and or a, fasc a fascist state. Uh, are we there yet? No. Are we moving in that direction? Certainly. 
We had a show um, with Carlos Suarez of the East West Center a couple of days ago um, um, to discuss an article which was in Foreign Affairs called "Is uh, Is Democracy Dying?" It wasn't a question; it was, it was a statement. Democracy is dying in Mexico under AMLO, um, and uh, you know what's really scary is it's a playbook, and it it, it rings it rings. You know, it rhymes with what um, Trump has been doing, the same things. And he's moving clearly to autocracy. And one of the big factors in Mexico is using the military as the police. This is very scary, very autocratic. So let me ask you another question. In the past few years, and more recently, has the media gotten smarter about um, digesting, interpreting, and uh, promulgating, uh, you know, uh, rather broadcasting, producing um, the news, uh, especially the news that's fed to it um, by, mm, you know, people who are looking at the political machinations every day. Is, is the media gotten smarter? And let me, and the subset to that is, have we gotten smarter? You know, you and me and, and uh, National Issues Take One and Two and Chuck Crumpton shows, um, are we more Akamai about appreciating the reality around us? Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the media has gotten smarter. No two ways about it. They do realize when they're being played by Trump or his acolytes. They realize it. They also realize that, you know, when a candidate now um, starts to spin their political spin room, that they're starting to call it out as spin. Whereas before, they would never dream of calling it spin. Uh, you know, it wasn't that long ago where it was forbidden for anyone in the media to out and out call a politician a liar. Well, they do it now. Uh, not as often as they ought to, but uh, they do it. And they, they do it, especially when Trump's at the microphone. They're not, they're more than happy to say this is an out and out lie and uh, he's lying. Wow. You know, 10 years ago, that was unheard of. So yeah. yeah, the media is sharper. Um, I think the consumer of media knows a little bit more than they used to. Uh, in many ways, they know when they're being played and what kind of examples are being played. Um, we talked about it on a previous show about polling. Uh, the media loves polling because they could uh, you know, make it seem like a horse race down to the final wire and they're coming up around the corner and, you know, and, and in the meantime, they get the ratings, they get more viewership, and guess what they get to do? Play more commercials, more revenue. So I think, I think the consumer of media is becoming more savvy. They're recognizing it. And unfortunately, that means they turn it off. And when they turn it off, that equals or can spell voter apathy. And that is the death knell, I think, of any republic. You know, let me take a moment um, from my questions that I have for you and uh, just ask about not so much apathy, but fatigue. Fatigue, you know? yeah. Fatigue. I mean, I, I was telling you yesterday that, um, you know, if I, if I get 500 emails a day from, you know, multicolored HTML emails, you know, asking me to give money to candidates I never heard of before in, in states I don't really care about or haven't cared about, um, I get tired of those emails. And as a result, I reject them all. I just, I delete them. As soon as I see the color, honestly, and, and, the, and the little tabs where I'm supposed to give money, I reject them and I, and I turn them off. And I am, I'm probably a good example of somebody who's- Yeah, but think about that statement. You're politically engaged and you're turned off. I'm, yes, I'm turned off from that email. And I am turned off from social media too, because I think there's so much trash on social media. Uh, my level of confidence, you know, that any given post is an accurate statement of anything is really low. And simply because so many of them are trash. And so uh, two reactions. One is I'm not alone. I am sure a lot of people are equally fatigued and fatigue, see if you agree with me, fatigue leads to apathy. Uh, it, lead, it leads to lower voter turnout. Uh, in some states, they're having high voter turnout right now today. I mean, they're all excited about, uh, you know, a, a debate or uh, all the publicity that some, some candidates are getting and all the scare they're getting from, um, you know, the Democratic, Democratic uh, media. 
But for the most part, I think a lot of people are turned off and they're not voting. There's not enough of this. I have no control over the result. And I am not going to, I'm not going to spend the time waiting online or whatever it is uh, to get past all those Republican obstacles. What do you think? Are we experiencing a significant, and I mean democratic fatigue here, uh, democratic, um, you know, voter, voter, uh, voter fatigue? Yes, definitely. And why is that? Because each election since the Obama era, each election had such high stakes involved. And it was advertised by the media as high stakes. For, and, and both sides see it that way. And so that means that there's a lot of stress. <laughs> and, and that means they're watching a lot more political news. And that's stressful. And after a certain point, especially with COVID, where you're locked in your house for two years, and you know, you're watching nothing but either uh, game shows or uh, political news shows. And you got burned out. You're fatigued. And I'm still surprised that the 2020 election had, what, an 80 million on the Democrat side and a 74, 75 million on the Republican GOP side for turnout of votes, the highest ever. And we'll see if 2022 is uh, similar to that. Uh, by uh, early description, some of the early voting is off the charts compared to 2020. Or even 2016. Don't forget, uh, one great indicator of fatigue is uh, uh, your immune system. And your immune system, if it's not working quite right, it, it gives you psoriasis. That's and uh, right. and, and Sky, Rizzi. Psori <laughs> Sky Rizzi and uh, Rinvoke and, and, and a dozen others that we see. We, we're all experts on psoriasis. Um, this is, I mean, it's a joke, of course. And it, what it really is, is uh, the network's trying to make a lot of money, the cable networks. Um, but but the reality is, I, I would guess that a lot of people have, you know, stress and therefore stress related diseases, not only because of um, COVID, but be, or the economy, um, but because of the political news that comes to them. But let me go back to a question I asked you uh, earlier. Um, has the media gotten smarter? Is my question. And, you know, you referred to the fact that media, the media was more Akamai about when somebody was lying and they called it out. In fact, I remember a really interesting discussion of the public editor of the New York Times. The public editor is the one that watches the reporters and makes sure the reporters are on, you know, are ethical. Um, very important position and, and good for them for having a public editor. And she talked about the internal debate over the use of the word liar. Mm -hmm. Went back three, four, five years. And you know, it was not universal, not unanimous. They argued about it for a long time before they came to the conclusion um, that lot, you know, to call a liar out is good. But you know, going beyond that, though, you know, I'm I'm just concerned that that the uh, that the media may not be giving us the priorities, the global priorities. I don't think, for example, they have taught the American electorate that um, when you compare gas prices against uh, the liberal world order. The liberal world order is more important. Um, but I don't think the American viewer understands that because the media hasn't made it clear. Um, and there's a lot of other things about, you know, they say, oh, this is a, an election for democracy. But the media hasn't made it clear what happens to us if we lose democracy. They haven't given us examples of rights that we would lose, of how our daily life would change. Well, I can get along. I'll just I'll go to Safeway, buy some food, um, and I'll be fine. I'll have my job. I'll have my bank account. Everything will be just fine. They don't realize, or the media doesn't teach us, that there are implications to losing your democracy. What do you think? Well, I think that would require a history lesson. It's not just the media's responsibility. It's, it's the education system. It's our family. It's our community to remind us of history and why it was important. Uh, look at our history and you'll see what happens when democracy starts to erode and you start seeing strong men start to uh, march in lockstep with other strong men, something called autocracy or fascism. Uh, maybe that's not the media's job, but it's certainly important. And, uh, you know, I'm just gonna go back to some of the sources of why we're in this pickle that we are. You know, the newsroom used to be a nonprofit, non-income revenue generator. Uh, it was a lost leader. 
It was a firewall saying the advertising should not make its way into the newsroom. Well, those days are gone. So now you have corporate influence. Uh, look at the CEO of CNN telling his news, all his commentators, telling everyone, don't use the term big lie. That's done with. Uh, what's that all about? As you guys could say, Jay, que pasa? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I really am very careful about CNN now for that reason, because that guy is running the, um, you know, is running the content. Let me go to my next question. Okay, we, we've all had, you know, some years of experience on this since 2016, since the election, where if you read, um, you know, uh, Tim Snyder's book, uh, uh, The Road to Unfreedom, you find out that, uh, that Putin was into it up to his eyeballs. And he made public statements about how Trump was his friend, he was going to do everything possible to get Trump elected, with details, with names and facts and figures, and all those names of people who got indicted and convicted, you know, I, I have a, a short list of them. I just, I, I read them to you. Um, Flynn, remember him? Man, still around, Manafort, he was pardoned. Stone, pardoned. Giuliani, eh, nothing yet. And there's others, uh, Carter Page, I think was another one of them. And, you know, they're all acolytes, they were all active. And here's the thing, they were all engaged with Russia. And probably the most chilling thing in that Comey Rules movie was where um, Trump tried to get Comey to lay off on Russia. And although, you know, you, you can't believe everything from that movie or from the book, Comey, um, I believe that, I think that's clear. Uh, he, was, he was really interested in separating himself from Russia. And ultimately he got Bill Barr to do that by misstating uh, the, the Mueller report. That was really crisis critical, and the result is Trump was Trump felt that he had been excused from the whole Russia connection. But in fact, there were so many indications, and Snyder goes through this in his book, that uh, Trump and Putin were bonded at the hip, and that they were each trying to help each other, and that Putin was dedicated to help Trump win in 2016 uh, with all of the resources at his command. No reason to think that uh, Putin isn't doing exactly the same thing. He did it in 2020 unsuccessfully, um, but we saw the indications of it, and he's probably doing it right now. So my question is, over the past few years, um, has Trump and his co-conspirators, including Putin, have they gotten smarter about affecting the American electorate? I would say probably yes. Um, anytime, a, you know, a cockroach has a, a flashlight shine on, they scamper and they find, you know, find cover. Uh, this is no different. Uh, you know, in 2016, they, they found out, okay, we had all these Russian bots. We had all these, you know, influences of, of, of messages that were unsubstantiated accounts on Facebook and Twitter. And so they, they, they recognized that and they started trying to clean that up. Okay, well, where did the cockroaches scamper to? Um, is it you know dark money for for campaign contributions? Is it dark money for uh, ad contributions? Uh, you know, is it uh, trying to infiltrate secretaries of state and prop up candidates uh, that way, trying to undermine our democracy and our electric, ele uh, electoral system by propping up um, you know lackeys and loyalists in those uh, those roles of government? Uh, it, there's a hundred different one ways to do this, Jay, and uh, who knows at this point which direction they've taken. But I guarantee you, they haven't. They haven't left the building. The building has not been fumigated. Yeah, and you know, you can say that uh, Trump is having trouble with the Department of Justice and some of the courts, not all of them, uh, about his um, Mar-a-Lago adventure. But uh, on the other hand, gee, that what a great way to distract the American public. Well, it's a great uh, reality show, and it's not clear where all of it goes. At the end of the day, you know, he's very good at escaping justice, uh, escaping indictments, uh, escaping the Department of Justice over so many issues in so many years. I mean, all, all the all the people who have sued him or called for criminal prosecution on him, um, you know, he he's Teflon. The guy's Teflon. 
And he's Teflon before his, he was elected. He's Teflon during his election. Teflon, you know, yep. after his election. So, you know, look, he got away with the Mueller report. Got away completely. Um, he did. He, he got away with all those guys uh, who were involved with Putin and Russia making deals for him and God knows what else and telling and telling secrets. Um, terrible bottom well, of the barrel people. And, go ahead. Well, even the Republicans had to take that Mueller report and admit there was overt Russian influence in 2016. They actually came out and said, yes, we, we acknowledge this. Now, you know, where were all the details? Well, the, you know, the report was so thick, we forgot the details. But the fact that the influence was there in 2016, and I guarantee you, Donald Trump's involvement with Russia was there decades earlier. I mean, he's working with the oligarchs. Who are the oligarchs uh, uh, emboldened to? Putin. So is this a trickle-down system of, um, you know, Donald Trump making and getting loans from, from Russia uh, under favorable conditions and terms? And there's a sense of indebtedness to that or obligation to that. And that's well before 2016. And uh, I don't think enough has been uh, highlighted on that. I think some media shows have done a pretty good job trying to connect the dots on his obligations of financial commitments in Russia, but not enough. Mm -hmm. And I think those, those things still hang over Donald Trump's head. Well, I think they're still active. Yeah. You know, if, you, if you look at that Tim Snyder book, you, you see that it was they were in a kind of love of, love affair in 2016, and and Putin was just as ardent as Trump was to get to get Trump uh, elected and succeeded with um, all of these these internet well, plays and social media, what have you. Don't uh, forget, once he was president, don't forget Helsinki. My God, that was a love affair right there in front of the world. Yeah. Okay, and then okay, and then he gets away with the first impeachment. Thanks to um, what's his name, McConnell, um, and Barr, and Barr, uh, he get right, and he gets away with doing all kinds of horrible, corrupt things, and damaging the government. You know, like I, I believe permanently, permanently, uh, through his his term, um, and then he has the insurrection on top of that, and so far he's gotten away with that, and he got away with the second impeachment. The guy's Teflon, and so it, it seems to me he's learned how to distract. Change the subject, New York style. It's hard to get your hands on a, a slippery cockroach who runs away. Um, and I think you know that 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 playbook is still in play. My next question for you is: Has the FBI and the DOJ and Homeland Security, you know, our primary first line of defense, um, you know, law enforcement agencies, have they gotten smarter? And before you answer, just remember that the insurrection was January 6, 2021. And here we are going on two years, and we're still watching the metronome tick day by day. And watching Congress have, have this, um, you know, so far unsuccessful select committee um, investigation. And the metronome ticks day by day without any real result. I'm sorry, no real result. Distraction in every direct direction, but no real result. So my question to you is, has the FBI, the DOJ, Homeland Security gotten smarter? If they hadn't been, they are now. And I think no greater thing has um, set the alarm bell um, ringing very loud in their heads right now is the documents, the classified documents that Donald Trump had at Mar-a-Lago. Some really serious top secret stuff and all three agencies are going, what was he doing with those? And what was he planning to do with those? Or what did he do with those? Uh, so I, I think they're, they're, they're awake now. I really do. Um, were they before? Well, yes, but they probably have, you know, like every agency, they have their infighting. And to what degree does Donald Trump still have his dedicated loyal staff fighting his, 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 his agenda for him? That are still in these agencies. We've we've done a show about that more than once. Uh, so you know everyone, you know you just can't get done what you want to get done when you have half your staff trying to work against you, or you know tr tried to uh, derail the agenda of prosecution. Yeah, now here's one we we've, we've talked about before, um, a number of times, and the media has talked about it constantly. So we have the possibility of indictments. 
Okay, we also have the possibility of a, 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 a crashing result, terrible, terrible result in two weeks. And again, in 2024, um, in a lawless society with lawless leaders. So the question is, do the possibility, does the possibility of these indictments change everything? Um, if Trump was you know, indicted on this, that, or the other thing, or all of them, or just some of them, um, does that does that really change anything, or are we are we being distracted um, by all of that? And is the reality something else? You know, and you have to in that in that analysis you have to factor in the appeals, um, the possibility that he will try to get this in front of a judge he has appointed, judges he has appointed, that he will intimidate witnesses, intimidate judges, intimidate jurors, lie as and when he can. I mean, we assume that. Um, and use social media. And, and I go to uh, episodes, uh, episode three, particularly in Rachel Maddow's uh, Ultra podcast, where um, there was a trial in 1940, and the, the FBI had the goods, the Department of Justice had the goods. But the, the people who were on the right wing of things, who were the racists and the anti Semites and, and the ones who wanted to overthrow the government, killed the State Congress. Department. Yeah. They were outside the courthouse uh, chanting in favor of the defense. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they were in the courtroom chanting in favor of the defense. And as, at the end of the day, the jury, um, the jury acquitted a good number of them. And the rest of them were declared a mistrial. And the result is a perfectly good case of 17 people who wanted to overthrow the government uh, that walked. And, and I'm saying, uh, do indictments really change anything? Because... You can have an indictment, even assuming you can get an indictment, which we've been waiting a long time, day by day, the metronome goes back and forth. Um, you've got to get to a, a prosecution, uh, a conviction, a punishment. All this takes a long time and a lot of vagaries. We know how many ways Trump has escaped this in the past, both civil and criminal. And, and, and I would factor one more thing in. Watch Elon Musk. And I do not trust that man. I do not think his his, uh, his sensibilities favor the the national interest at all. And he is he is supposed to close on Twitter this week, this week supposed to. And if he closes on Twitter, he's made it clear um, that he's going to let Trump get back on Twitter, and that's Trump's favorite and most effective platform. So that is it's a factor in whether indictments or prosecutions can affect what's going to happen going forward, the rule of law, if you will. So we've talked about it before. I know what you've said, but I want to ask you again, do the does the possibility of indictments really affect the result of the attack on our democracy? Yes, and here's why. We don't know how things unfold as the feature rolls, rolls along. Sometimes... It's plan and, you know, you can, you know, as the divers say, you, you plan the dive, you dive the plan. But when it comes to the arena of politics and government, we don't know what unfolds. It's kind of like um, Texas Hold'em where you get one card and you don't know if you should bet on it or not, but you do. And then you get the card you wanted on the next hand. And so you have to start somewhere. You have to get the ball rolling somehow. And the indictment is that first if you will, those first three cards in Texas hold them. And um, well, are, you, are you guaranteed success? By no means. But you have to get the synergy, the ball rolling, and things, you know, in nature, things kind of fall together. They come together. And uh, that may well be the case in the prosecution and possibly conviction of Donald Trump. It'll be a historic moment. No sitting, no, no president, former president, has ever been indicted. Uh, there'll be a sense of uh, awareness on that. <clears throat> there'll be a sense of, of historic grandeur, if you will. Now, the MAGA GOP will see as a, 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 a badge of courage. They'll, 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 they'll mock it, but they'll see it as, you know, their fearless leader taking one for the team in order to uh, implement his agenda for the good of all the nation. So it, it'll be perceived differently by different uh, factions of this country. But it's imperative that it begin, and I think things will come together. And uh, Donald Trump, although he is Teflon, um, 
even on the best of pants, Teflon wears off after a, a number of years. <laughs> that is, that's totally quotable. <laughs> I, I, that'll be on the final exam for sure. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. I mean, uh, you know, uh, I'm, you're kind of optimistic in that way. Um, two weeks from now, we'll know a lot more. And I was saying before the show, it's very hard to predict and you imply the same notion. It's very hard to predict um, what will happen here because there are so many variables at play, so many possibilities. I mean, for example, um, you know, um, a, a couple of politicians, more than a couple, a number of GOP MAGA, MAGA politicians have said that if he's indicted, um, there will be violence. And, and Okay, and, well, we've had that before. Guess what? Didn't get very far. You can't stop violence, but you sure can stop it from getting bigger. You know, let me go to another question about that. Um, I, I don't believe that there will be another insurrection along the same lines as we had on January 6th. But I do believe that we'll have insurrection in other forms. Insurrections in state capitals around the country. Insurrections. Yeah, it's happening it. now. Yeah, and proud boys on the streets and people who don't respond to subpoenas and Sitting congress, congressmen who don't respond to subpoenas, it's incredible. Um, more and more of them, it seems like. So, and public officials all over the place who were sworn to reject uh, any vote they don't like or any Democratic vote they don't like. Um, so I guess insurrections come in many forms, many flavors. Insurrections can be by these state officials, by appointees and acolytes, by Proud Boys. Um, and any number of other things. And uh, where does that play in all of this? I, I, I think we have to broaden our definition of insurrection because one way or the other, the people, you can quote me on this, the people who are behind that insurrection on January 6th, um, the co-conspirators in the Willard and otherwise, and not only the boys at the bottom, but the boys at the top, they're still there. They're busy. They're still around, they're busy boys. And yeah. so we could have another insurrection. We're probably having one right now in a different flavor. Do you agree? I absolutely agree that there are forces at work that are trying to undermine our existing form of government. Um, there are forces at work that are very subtle, that aren't catching the headlines, but the placement of people at the right time in the right position, uh, ready to act if need be, uh, to ensure their candidate wins. Now, does that mean we're gonna have a faulty election? No, but you know, if you play chess, you know the game isn't won with the, the direct move. It's always the, the chess pieces on the, on the side that uh, enable the direct move to take place. And that's how you get checkmate. So like a game of chess here, um, the pieces are slowly being moved into place. Um, and will there be a direct move? Well, it depends on who's winning. Okay, uh, one more question about, about getting smarter. Um, so we have seen Joe Biden operate for the past two years. And we sort of know how he does operate, where he comes from, that is a career in the Senate. No? Um, and we know how he handles things under pressure. We know how he responds to um, the attacks by the GOP and, and Trump, which are relentless. Uh, so my question to you is, over the past what is it, almost two years, has Joe Biden gotten smarter in using the, 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 the tools available to him, the levers of government and the levels of uh, social media, the levels of his bully pulpit, his platform? Has he gotten smarter in using those things to countermand uh, what Trump and the co-conspirators are doing. He has. He's gotten smarter on what the tools are, but he hasn't exercised his ability to use those tools to his advantage. And that's a problem. Um, it's one thing to learn something. It's another to use it to your advantage and to win the day. Uh, I don't know if it's just by age or that he's distracted or he doesn't see the importance of what it is that is really underfoot here. But he does understand now the power of social media. He does understand the power of, 
of um, you know multi messaging that's constant. It's you know a, a blitzkrieg of of messages and how that does influence people and undermine his agenda. You know, uh, in that show I mentioned about the president of Mexico, the president of Mexico uh, is really odd and ironic. It does what FDR did back in the 30s. Uh, he has a fireside chat with people once a week and spends an hour or two with them just schmoozing on the media. And this has endeared him to his base. He's trying to create a base the same way that Trump has got his base. Um, and Trump, you know, Trump talks to them in many ways. The rallies have multiple effects. They are, in effect, I guess, uh, along with the social media, Trump's way of doing fireside chats. So the question I, I put to you is, is Biden learn how to do that? Because I think you've got to bond up with the electorate. And here we are with these, uh, you know, like uh, pessimistic expectations for the election in two weeks. Uh, and, and I know that, uh, you know, midterms don't favor the existing president, but, you know, could he have done better? Can he do better in terms of connecting with people, of having that eyeball to eyeball fireside chat kind of influence on the electorate, of, of pulling people away from Trump's base? I, I think there was a time when Joe Biden could, to, could do that and do that well. Um, he could speak off the cuff, he could improvise. He could speak readily on a, a variety of topics and policies with the greatest of ease. Unfortunately, Joe Biden now is basically limited to a script and a teleprompter. And that's hard to have an interactive uh, fireside chat when you're reading a script. And I don't, I, I think partly, partly is that his staff is worried that he's going to say something that he ought not to, uh, which he's done in the past the second he goes off script. And I, I just think Joe Biden's um, mental acuity isn't what it used to be. And that's unfortunate because I think he has a lot of great ideas, but he's starting to show some frailty. Last question is um, to the extent that Joe Biden uh, loses ground or the Democrats lose ground in two weeks from now, um, how did that affect uh, the, um, the direction uh, of, of life in Europe the growth of autocracy, autocracies in Europe, um, uh, Africa, uh, Latin America, and certainly China, which is has its own uh, its own development in autocracy. Um, so, if, I, I, if Biden loses, uh, and and if 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 the Democrats lose, it's Biden's loss really uh, in the elections coming in two weeks. How does that affect American influence I, overseas? I, I, and if, and if there's a fragmentation of the EU and NATO, which it looks like that may very well happen, and the growth of the influence of Putin, relatively speaking, in Europe, you know, um, how does that affect Biden's chances going forward? It's an echo chamber. Mm -hmm. I, I think for 2022, it doesn't affect it much, unless there's um, loud overtones about a retraction of commitment to Ukraine. That would be the telltale sign, and I think that would have, that would fracture EU and their dedication to supporting Ukraine. Uh, but I think really the big test would be if Donald Trump were to become the nominee of the Republican Party again. And if that happens, I, I think you can expect uh, all sorts of um, fracturing of EU's commitment uh, to trying to preserve their form of democracy and their form of parliaments and things of that nature. Um, but that's, that's 2023, not 2022. You know, it's like the stock market, isn't it? Um, that you, that the stock market is based on expectations. So uh, Biden doesn't have to lose and Trump doesn't have to win. It's all what, what, what the policymakers, uh, the, the influencers uh, think will happen, whether it's time for that to happen or not. Uh, and I suggest that if it if these things uh, sort of take the direction of um, Biden losing and Trump winning and Putin winning, um, people will act on that, even though the ultimate has not happened yet, like the stock market. Yeah. Well, and I, I'd just like to say that, you know, in a midterm, it is often expected that the House will swing to the other party. I mean, it's not unusual that it's, that happens. So 
In this case, if it does happen, it's not a real statement about Donald Trump's influence. It's kind of a natural course of events. Now, if they lose both the Senate and the House, then, you know, that's more of a, a dramatic statement. But uh, certainly the loss of one House, the House of Representatives, I, I don't see it as a cataclysmic event. Uh, it's a natural course of politics. Okay, last question. You know, the, the Democratic press, uh, MSNBC, and to some extent CNN, and for that matter, to some extent, the uh, BBC and, um, and Shepard Smith, um, you know, uh, all um, you know, express concern over these distractions, uh, what we see, and, and the, the fragmentation and the chaos, and the political chaos that, you know, more and more revealing itself. But I can see, and maybe I'm asking you to look too, into what happens after this election when uh, the Republicans win at least one House and maybe two, uh, and then you have the press trying to react to that. And the same newscasters that we see every day, now they're wringing their hands and they're saying, oh my goodness gracious, what's gonna happen? And they worry too about the First Amendment. They worry too about you know, the future of the FCC and, and, the, and the, you know, the, the freedom of the press, especially the big media and the ownership of the big media. Um, all these are complicated issues. So what's your thought about what happens to the press if the worst case analysis comes true? What are they gonna report on? What are they gonna say? What are they gonna focus on? And I suppose they can sell a, a, a lot more psoriasis medicine. Um, <laughs> but what, what, you know, how, how do you see that unfolding? Uh, aside from the wringing of hands, how will the press be covering it? Okay, that's it, the wringing of hands. What I'm getting tired of the press doing is the wringing of hands, which becomes the prediction, and the prediction becomes the advice towards a candidate or his, you know, his advisors. The media has to stop playing the role of a predictor and, and or advice giver. Um, and that's the problem with not just reporting the news. That's the problem of trying to mix the news with commentary and editorial. So... Um, Believe me, Donald Trump watches a lot of news. And guess what? Sometimes he picks up on the ideas presented on MSNBC and, and their guests and CNN and their guests. So yeah, hand-wringing is a natural uh, occurrence from after any election. But get over it and start reporting the news and stop making predictions of what will be versus what might be. Okay. And I suppose here on this show, we are not going to do any hand wringing. Well, we're not going to do too much. No, we'll soak our heads in cold water, but we're not going to do any hand, hand wringing. That's correct. <laughs> Tim Apicella here on uh, National national Issues, American Issues, take two. Thank you so much for this very, Thank very, you, Dave. very important discussion. Aloha. Bye. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.